Captain's Log, star date 4931.4. We are in orbit around Namin 4, a planet shrouded in mystery. Located in neutral space near the Klingon border, this world was deemed off limits 10 years ago to protect its population of primitive hunter gatherers. All that has changed. We have picked up a powerful subspace transmission emanating from the planet's surface. How could a civilization with no known technology produce such a sophisticated signal? Is this evidence of a Klingon violation of the Organian Peace Treaty? Our landing party is preparing to beam down, but the prime directive is paramount. We must find the source of this enigmatic signal, we must not contaminate this developing culture, and above all, we must preserve the precarious peace with the Klingon Empire. Hi friends, this is Joe. As you could tell from that teaser up front, today I thought I would present a Star Trek adventure for y'all. For um, so what happens is this, right? I sit down and I think I'm really behind in feedbacks. I'm going to do an all feedback episode. But then I think, but this is a gaming podcast. I need to give them some gaming content. So let me come up with something really short that I can, that I can develop not that I can develop, that I can say quickly, you know, give it a little front end, and then the bulk of the episode will be feedback. And then I develop that idea more and more, and I'm like, okay, that needs to be its own ele- <laughs> its own episode, and next week will be the feedback. <laughs> so that's what I'm going with. Next week will be the feedback, because as you know, I've said it before, I work two jobs, right? And sometimes the schedules line up, like they did this week, that... I work a full week at like one job and then my next job, I work the full weekend and then I'm working the full week back at my primary job again. And so that's 12 days of work in a row. And, um, you know, in addition to working the full days over the weekend, it's a two hour drive there. It's in Niagara Falls and two hour drive back. So, um, yeah, that's, I I took my stuff with me and I was going to record there. It didn't work out, though. So I'm calling this adventure The Silent Scream, or maybe The Silent Siren, something like that. And the idea is, as you heard, we we have this planet. I call it Naming 7. Uh, Naming is a Mongolian word. Um, Always struck me that so many of the names in classic Trek are very Western European. And the whole concept behind Trek was this future of Earth that isn't Western European specific, right? That's we, why we have Sulu and Uhura and uh, Chekhov, right? To, to represent cultures that are not American or European. And uh, yeah, all the planets always have European names. So I wanted to name this one something different. Anyway, uh, I'm also presenting this adventure a little differently than your traditional adventure. Well, first of all, it's an adventure seed, right? I'm not going to spend hours on here laying out all the scenes and everything. Uh, indeed, indeed. instead, this is very much inspired by the format of an old traveler book called 76 Patrons. And in 76 Patrons, Mark Miller would lay out, well, the conceit of the book was that these were patrons, which is traveler speak for NPCs that want to hire the party to do something. And so the first part, they always call the player's information, which is information you give to the player. And then the next part are six items, four, three, two, you know, more than one (laughs) options for what the actual adventure could be. And that way, even if your players had the book, you know, they were their own referee, they ran their own campaign, it could end up being a different adventure. Well, it most certainly would, because again, they're only seeds and every GM, every referee is going to grow that plant, if you will, grow that adventure differently, you know, to reflect their own style and stuff. But the the whole thing, what it really is, could also be different. For example, um, let's look at this one right here. So this is the very first one out of the book. The first one says that the NPC is a noble playboy. Again, these would be things that you would roll up on the uh, a table that was in book three. But anyway, um, yeah. Required skills, none, and required equipment, none. You know, some uh, some adventures might require like a computer skill if the whole adventure revolves around hacking into something or it might revolve or <laughs> it might need um, a ship. 
you know, stuff like that. The player's information says that the group is contacted by a newly married couple who declined to give their names, but have reason to believe that the respective parents are not pleased with their union. They will pay 3,000 credits to each member of a group which will escort them safely to a planet beyond their parents' sphere of influence. All right, that's it for the player's information. That's all it gives. Um, who refuse to give their names. Clearly, it's Romeo and Juliet, right? Um, anyway, and then for referee's information, uh, it gives six possibilities. And possibility number one is that the couple has overestimated their parents' reaction. No attempt is being made to have either one kidnapped or murdered. Naturally, in the course of a normal interstellar voyage, a group of this size, obviously traveling in fear of something, is bound to attract both official and unofficial attention. Second option is that agents of one family will attempt to kidnap the woman. The size of the kidnapper's group should be adjusted by the referee according to the armament and abilities of the adventurer's band. Number three is the same as number two, but the man is the kidnapped target. Call it kidnapping, call it rescue, you know, it depends on, on your point of view. Uh, number four, agents of one family will attempt to have the woman killed. The referee should determine the size of the attacking band as in number two. And number five is the same as number four, but they're going to try to kill off the man. And number six, uh, both families will attempt to kill one of the couple and kidnap the other. Two independent groups should be created by the referee. That's the most fun. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. As you heard um, or saw, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, that's that's all they give for the adventure. But it's enough. It's an adventure seed, right? In GURPS, Steve Jackson had these in all the world books. They call them adventure seeds. I love them. I think they're great. It's just enough inspiration to give you, the referee, an idea of how to create the adventure. And now that we've read these things, you're like, they have all these ideas. And, you know, ideally, not ideally, you know, optionally, you can roll to determine which one of these or you just pick one. That sounds the most interesting. If I were picking one, I would probably pick number one because the idea that no one's after them. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I like it. Um, the other option is number six, where both are trying to rescue their person and kill the other. Um, I just think that's the, the best adventure. But anyway, that's 76 Patrons. That's one of my favorite gaming books of all time. You know, I, I want to do a review of that book. I need to find somebody who wants to do that review with me. <laughs> Any uh, volunteers? Bonus points if you're willing to go on camera. Anyway, so let me present this adventure, uh, the adventure of the silent scream. I call it the silent scream because it's that subspace signal, right? So the people on the planet, they can't hear it. But yeah, it's screaming out into space and attracting the attention. So I have seven. <laughs> I have seven possibilities for what it could be. Number one, possibility number one is that it's a Klingon signal. The Klingons have landed on this planet and are. You know what? I don't think it was in the log, log was it? Oh, dang it. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I left out, it was in an earlier draft of the log. Uh, one of the things I left out of the log was that this planet is rich in dilithium, but they won't mind, the Federation won't mind it because it's a developing culture and the Prime Directive prohibits contact with uh, developing cu cultures. So the Klingons have no such uh, problem. So they're there on the planet mining the, the dilithium and using subjugated labor, let's say, of the locals. So then it's up to the crew to figure out how to stop the Klingons and how to minimize the cultural damage done to the planet. That's option number one. Uh, option number two is, it's kind of the flip side of that co same coin. Instead of the Klingons, it's section 31. It's a Federation outpost they're not after the dilithium as much as they're setting up a listening post to spy on the Klingons. Like I said, this is very near the Klingon world, right? But they're sending out the signal and that's going to cause problems. And the other problem is that because the signal is going out there, 
the Klingons are going to hear it, and the Klingons are on their way to investigate. So the crew has to deal with this and the Klingons while trying not to start an interstellar war. Option number three. The signal is coming from an ancient alien artifact. If you remember, there is a episode of the original series called The Paradise Syndrome. It's the Native American episode, if you will. Kirk goes on this planet. He doesn't have his memory. There's this alien artifact there, uh, but he has issues fitting in with the culture. He marries the chief's daughter. Uh, they make him the medicine man. And the Goy and Spock show up at the end and figure out that the alien device was left by a race called the Preservers that picked up ancient cultures uh, that were in danger of disappearing and planted them on different planets throughout the uh, galaxy, which goes a long way to explaining a lot of things that the Enterprise comes across. Uh, so maybe it's it's an artifact left by them, and for some reason it's sending out a subspace signal, and the players have to figure out why and shut it off, because again, the Klingons are hearing it, Klingons are on their way. Option number, th option number three is almost the flip side of that coin. Instead of an alien artifact, it's almost like option number one from the actual Traveler book. It's, it's nothing. It's actually a natural phenomena. There's this dilithium deposit that's grown near an, another crystal deposit with a piezoelectric effect. And with the two of them in close proximity, it's starting to send out subspace signals. I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, that's probably the simplest for the players to deal with once they figured out what it is and all that. They just have to destroy the natural formation while avoiding contact with the locals if they make contact, coming up with a cover story and all that fun stuff. And three, of course, the Klingons heard it, so they're on their way. So the Klingons, I imagine, would show up and say, you are doing experiments on this planet, blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah, a nice little thing for them to deal with. Option number, I think we're up to four. Option number four is that it's actually a it's actually a crashed Klingon ship, and it's the distress speaking, and the signal it's sending out is just garbled because it's damaged. This one you might think is fairly simple, except the players are going to go down there and the Klingons are going to be distrustful of them and they're not going to let them just rescue them. And then when the Klingons show up, they're going to accuse the player ship of having shot down the Klingon ship and fun ensues. All right. Flip side of that coin, it's not a Klingon ship. It's a Federation ship. But the Federation crew has been there a while and they have made contact with the locals. And in traditional Klingon fashion, no, sorry, and in traditional Star Trek fashion, what do NPC characters do when they crash land on a planet? They present themselves as gods to the local populace. So um, the locals are worshiping these crash survivors as gods the crash survivors know they're in deep doo-doo for doing this, so they don't want to go back with the Federation. And so it's up to the players to figure out how to bring back the Federation folks, you know, and clean up all their Federation technology. While minimize all that tremendous damage that's already been done to the developing culture. All right. Oh, wait. Actually, before I go to the next one, bonus points for that last one. Instead of making them just Federation people going wrong, um, make the crash ship a Terran Empire ship. That's the Federation of the Mirror Universe. <laughs> you know, Spock with the beard. Yeah, I think that could be fun. Wow. The last option. In this option, the ship, nope, sorry. In this option, the signal turns out to be an automated distress signal coming from the player's ship itself. Well, coming from the ground, but it was launched by the player's ship. And the reason why it couldn't be deciphered was because it's going backwards. And when they finally decipher it, it turns out that the timestamp from the distress signal is that it was sent 
three days in the future. And, um, yeah, and that they were shot down by a Klingon ship. And, of course, now they're going to pick up Klingons on the way. Um, so if the option with the alien artifact was very much like the Paradise Syndrome, I think this option is very much like an episode that was called Cause and Effect for the Next Generation. If you remember that episode, that is very much a Groundhog Day-like episode, right? They're in this time loop and it keeps repeating and the number three keeps showing up because Data has this little subconscious memory and he's injecting the three because that's uh, significant to the ending of the episode. So those are my ideas. I went kind of quick because it's Monday. I'm trying to get this out for Wednesday, which means it really needs to go out tomorrow. And like I said, I try to record over the weekend. It, it's that 12-day work week thing. It takes a lot out of me. Um, but that's the ideas for this uh, the Star Trek. I think it would work with any version of the Star Trek game. I mean, if you do Modiphius all the way back to doing the Heritage Models one, you could even use my own shirts and skirts. Actually, it would work great for shirts and skirts. I do plan on running a shirts and skirts game as an actual play. But this is going to be the adventure. I have another adventure I'm working on for that. Um, so what do you think of this format of adventure, this uh, 76 patrons format, if you will? I really love it. Um, I, I I like to call myself a world builder. I like to think um, that I'm creative. <laughs> Am I? I hope so. And I prefer things like this that give me something to work with and let me run with it as opposed to like your traditional TSR cardboard bound module where it says, okay, this is everything for you. Of course, like B1, B2, they had spots for you to fill out and everything. That was kind of nice. But still, um, I talked before, there's a whole few episodes about another uh, supplement called Frontier Forts of Kelnor for Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, you can use it for any fantasy game, um, which is another one of my very favorite products because it's a lot like this instead of being an adventure it's an adventure generator and I, I just love that 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 speaks to the kind of gm referee dungeon master judge whatever you want to call it that i am um what about you do, do you like the the ready-made stuff or do you like this where it's just a seed and and you can run with it um another one speaking of adventure seeds in gurps bunnies and burrows Towards the end, well, those sound seeds are always, there's like four or five that I'm like, I, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you could string them together as a campaign wonderfully and it would work beautifully if you wanted to run a Bunnies and Burrows campaign. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to wrap up here because I still have to edit and all that fun stuff. Sorry that it's such a rushed episode. Um, sorry for a whole lot of things, but it was either this or no episode at all. And I preferred to do this. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening or watching, depending on how you're consuming this. Feel free, please, even, I'm begging you, send me feedback, feedback at jackiehedron.com or any of the other methods that are in the show notes. Or, of course, if you're on YouTube, you can leave comments in the box below. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye.